as you have your heart this morning, church. Because I'll tell you, that changes everything. Father, we just give you our heart this morning. We lay down our lives. We lay down our, our will. We give you our yes. We step into obedience. Uh, we follow you. As Christians, we are to be followers of Christ. That means we go where you go. We do what you do. We say what you say, Father. And that is real life. That is true life. That is abundant life. So, Father, let us not miss out on that abundant life because we've chosen to put limitations on what you can do in us through our stubbornness, through our rebellion, through our laziness and inactivity, through our excuses, through the sins that we won't let go of and won't repent of, Father, whatever they are. God, let your church step fully in to all you have for us. Make us a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Let us light the way. Let us be the salt of the earth, Father God. We thank you. We praise you and we glorify your name. Father, open up our hearts this morning to receive your word. And I pray it would penetrate every single one of us and accomplish its work. In Jesus' name, amen. Do this, church. Say, Jesus, you can have my heart. Amen. All right. You can have a seat. Thank you so much, Manny, for bringing my table over. And um, I actually, I have a confession to make. I went a little, um, a little uh, illustration crazy today. And I was just talking to Ray over here, and I was like, Ray, I even thought of another illustration like two minutes before service started. And I thought, okay, we got some walk-up music. Um, <laughs> and I thought to myself, maybe that's too much, last minute. But Ray was like, go for it. And so thanks to Ray, I need two guys. Um, there's a table over here, and um, it's got some jars and some lids on it. And I need two strong and well-balanced individuals that can carry this table up onto the platform without dumping the glass onto the ground and shattering everywhere, okay? All right, so we got Steve, and Steve brought a friend. What's your friend's name again, Steve? What, what is it? Ken. Ken. Let's give it up for Ken and Steve. <laughs> Let's also give it up for um, my team in the sound booth that did not know that I had an illustration today, and they're just going to be really flexible and roll with this because they're awesome. Let's give it up for them. Yeah, I think just on the side here is probably okay. If that works from the camera point of view, is this okay right here, Jason? Perfect. Yeah, and then we'll just turn it facing that way. Yep, front facing that way. Perfect. Beautiful. And they didn't break anything. That's awesome. Let's give it up for them one more time. Yeah, that would have been really ironic if they broke something right after I said that, right? Yeah, my, my wife would be mortified because I decided to do this five minutes before service started. Didn't have a chance to clean these jars off. So she'd be like, what are you doing? But you guys are going to get the point, right? It's going to be worth it. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's going to be worth it. And I'm not going to be offended by the dirty jars. God's not offended by you, so. <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, welcome back. Um, th this was kind of a crazy couple of weeks um, in between two major series that I've been praying about and planning for a couple of months now. And uh, we finished a, a series on prayer. And then we went into uh, Good Friday and Easter. And then now we have these two weeks before Family Fifth Sunday. And what started out as a one-off, as we call them in the business, has now turned into a two-part series. And last week, I shared a message with you called Capacity. And I talked about how God will often use suffering in our life to increase our capacity to receive his blessing. 
Uh, how many of you know that there's some things that God wants to give you, but it's got to be in his timing, right? And there's things that God wants to give you, but sometimes you're not ready for it. Amen? There's, there's things that he wants to pour out, uh, but yet you are not in a place in your life uh, where you can handle it. Maybe there's a character change that needs to take place, or maybe it's just the wrong timing. And if he were to give it to you now, it would self destruct. And so often he uses times of waiting, times of suffering, times of struggle to begin to build your character, to build your endurance, to build your faith, to teach you how to wait and to trust in the Lord in those seasons. And at just the right time, he is faithful to pour out his blessing. What did Paul say in Galatians 6, 9? He said, do not grow weary while doing good for in due season or at just the right time, you will reap a harvest of blessing if you what? Anybody know? Faint not. That's like King James. I love that, right? I like uh, NLT says, if you do not give up, don't give up because God is at work. And sometimes we forget that the suffering could actually be the answer to your prayer. It could be through the suffering that he's going to bring the blessing. And sometimes the suffering is the answer to the prayer that you should be praying. Maybe you need to stop praying with God. Give me, give me. I need, I need. And instead start praying, God, mold me, shape me into the image of your son. And it is when we stop wrestling against God, as Jacob did, but instead, when, he, uh, when God wrenched his hip out of socket, instead of using his strength to try to overpower God, it says that he clung to him and said, I will not let go until you bless me. And we have to come to a point in our life where um, instead of struggling against God's will and, and just um, fighting to have all our questions answered, instead, we just cling to him. And hold on for the blessing because we can be certain that the blessing is coming. But not only does God want to increase your capacity to receive his blessing, but how many of you know that he wants to increase your capacity to be a blessing? He doesn't just want you to be satisfied and full, but he also wants you to overflow. And if you're overflowing, it's not for the purpose of you just looking like you have more than you could ever need, but so you can overflow on and onto others. And so capacity, think of a bucket. A capacity is not how much you can hold, but it's also about how much you can pour out. And see, when God blesses us, he blesses us with a purpose so much bigger than anything we ever had in mind. And so sometimes as God's people, when we pray for God's blessing, we're praying short-sighted prayers. How many of you admit that, that by nature we think the world revolves around us, right? And anytime anything changes within the church or in the workplace, our first thought is, how does this affect me? And that's just our human nature. And so when we pray, we want God to meet our need. But his vision is beyond our need. He looks at the needs of the church. He looks at the needs of the entire world. And he wants to bless you and use your momentum to bring a blessing upon others. I don't know if you've heard of a guy named Newton. Sir Isaac Newton, right, a uh, famous scientist, and he has these three laws that were taught in school. And the first law is this, is that an object will remain at rest unless acted on by an external force. There are also spiritual laws, and I think that they correlate with these laws today. See, just like it states in that first law that an object remains at rest unless it is acted upon by an external force, so every blessing that you have ever received has been something that was acted on you by an external force, by God, and sometimes often through another person. And that created a change in your position. It changed your circumstance. And so it moved you. A blessing is always from outside of ourselves. And there are those around us that will remain at rest until they are acted on by your blessing. 
Make sense? His second law is this, that force equals mass times acceleration. Now, force, in this analogy, we'll call it the potential impact of a blessing. Okay? So force, it's the mass times acceleration. And it's, the force is the potential impact of a blessing. And the mass is the love or the motivation behind the blessing. Okay? This determines how much of a force is going to take place. What is the motivation behind your blessing? How many of you know you can, you can do something just kind of ceremonially uh, to bless someone and it doesn't quite uh, carry as much weight? Uh, case in point, um, someone is uh, suffering and they share their, their, um, their story with you and you respond with just a platitude like, oh, I'm sorry for your loss. You know, but it's really awkward and you just move on really quickly. And then there's the person that has the gift of empathy. And you come and you share with them their struggles. And not only do they listen and look you in the eye, but they ask you questions. How are you feeling? How are you doing? And then they embrace you and they cry with you. See, there's a lot more mass behind that blessing because the love and the motivation behind it is authentic. And then the acceleration for us is God's timing plus our immediate obedience. God's timing plus our immediate obedience. See, God has perfect timing, which is why delayed obedience is disobedience. Because God has a a particular frame of time that he has in mind to work in. And when we delay, then we're actually disobeying. And so here's what's awesome, though. You can write this equation down in your notes if you want. Love plus immediate obedience equals a life greatly impacted. Love plus immediate obedience is a life equals a life greatly impacted. And finally, his third law is for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. It's like the scriptures when it talks about the law of measures. And we're gonna get into some of those passages today. Like, he who sows uh, sparingly will reap sparingly, sows uh, generously, he'll reap generously, right? And so I brought with you today, I brought with me to today an illustration. This is called Newton's uh, Cradle. Have you guys ever seen this before? Maybe you thought it was nothing more than a desk toy. But in fact, it is a science experiment, right, that proves Newton's laws of nature. And so what happens is the idea is that this can uh, create some momentum that can cause the other uh, spheres that hang from these strings to move back and forth, right? But the key to it all is it only works if the ball is swinging in the direction of the other balls, right? And see, and of course, this table's wobbly, so that's why it's not working perfectly. Let's see. Got to steady it. See that? Somebody say, ooh, ah. Very good, very good. And so what happens so often, though, is this is how, so this is how we keep the blessings of God flowing. This is what God has in mind. When he blesses us, it's never just, here's Joe. Joe is asking for a blessing, and so I'm going to lift him up, and then he's going to remain static. No, he always has the next step in mind. This is Joe. He's blessed, and he's my servant, and so I'm going to bless him, and I'm going to trust that he's going to be a faithful steward of that blessing, and he's going to take that blessing, and he's going to transfer the energy of that blessing to someone else, and that blessing is going to go to this person, and that person is going to pay it forward to that person until finally the end result is that the blessing continues to live on. See, God not only wants to increase your capacity to receive, but also your capacity to give. And oftentimes, we don't receive the blessing because we keep allowing the blessing to stop with us. Am I making sense to anyone today? Mark Batterson puts it this way. He says, God doesn't bless selfishness. If the blessing stops with you, it'll eventually stop altogether. Instead of being a conduit for blessing and maintaining forward momentum, we settle for sideways energy. How often do we settle for sideways 
energy. God speaks to us and we don't share what he said. God blesses us and we don't tell anybody and we, we use that blessing for selfish purposes. When there's an opportunity in front of us everywhere we go to multiply that blessing. I got to tell you, a big reason why we sit at tables here at the fountain is to avoid sideways energy. Because here's the deal, you can come to a church and you can listen to a sermon and you can leave and you may receive a blessing, but it often stops with you. But when we gather around tables, what's happening is by positioning ourselves differently, we ensure that we are not experiencing sideways motion, but forward motion. We're taking what we're receiving and we're also bringing something to the table. It's why we've stopped calling these services. It's why we started calling them gatherings. Because like a family gathering, nobody shows up to Thanksgiving empty-handed, but everybody brings something to the table. And no one is burdened and no one is worn out because they had to bring a a sweet potato casserole with them to Thanksgiving because they understand they're going to share in the benefits of the entire meal. And this is the mentality that the church has got to adopt. God wants to unleash his life in this church, but what needs to happen is we have to understand that we all come to the table with something every single time, not once a month or twice a month, but every time you're here. And so what happens on top of that, which is so great, is that each person you bless, whether it's at your tables or at your workplace or at your school students, becomes a blessing to you. Let me explain. There is nothing like experiencing God when he's flowing out of you. There's just nothing like it. I have been to conferences galore, youth camps, conventions, powerful revival services, times of worship that were so impactful, but you know what tops it all? When I'm on the street corner telling my story and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with somebody who's never heard it or maybe never heard it quite put that way. And even though I didn't know what I was gonna say before I started talking, as I opened up my mouth in obedience, the Holy Spirit began to come upon me and the words were downloaded in my mind and they began to come out with such ease and I'm hearing these things being said from my own mouth for the very first time and it's bringing new revelation to me something that only happens out of the overflow. And see, we're starting to just, I got something really exciting to share with you guys. I am so excited about this. God put on my heart years ago, before I was ever the pastor of this church. He said, Joe, not that I just hear his audible voice. You know how some pastors act like, yeah, we just sit and we have this conversation. He sounds kind of like Elvis, you know, no, right? I mean, (laughs) But he impressed very firmly upon my heart, Joe, I want to make Fountain of Life a neighborhood church. We have existed for way too long and the neighborhood around us has not felt the impact the way that they should. And so since um, I began, the church has come together and we have put this neighborhood focus and we're trying to do more and more in the community to bless them, to show them the love of Jesus Christ. It may not always be a, a gospel presentation, but it is a gospel representation because there's a world that's hurting that needs to see something tangible, needs to see the love of Jesus. And so we're doing these things, some of these things that we think are just simple, just Just regular activities. They're not. They're God-ordained to create interactions and to create relationships of influence. And so when we have a back-to-school splash and there's a bunch of screaming, crazy kids going down water slides, it's Jesus uh, uh, demonstrating his love for the community. When we have a hayride and there's over 300 people on our campus, it's so that they can experience the love of Jesus. And through those relationships, there will be a divine appointment to share share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I do believe we're going to begin to see our neighborhood come to Christ. And we're just starting to get a glimpse of that. See, our efforts in blessing the community have come back to us. 
Just this past week, we received a check in the mail for $5,000. Not from somebody who goes to church here, but from somebody who lives in this neighborhood. I'm overwhelmed at their generosity, so I ask Aaron, our accountant, can I please get their email address so I can thank them? And I sent a thank you note to this, to this lady, and she replies back to me, and this is what her email said. Thank you and your church body. My husband and I are grateful for you, for the, fa- for the fountain as a neighbor. Your congregation exemplifies loving your neighbor as yourself. Church, this is just the beginning. This is after just a couple years of efforts. Imagine what God is going to do in this community and who he's going to inspire and who he's going to impress upon to be a blessing as we, for the next 10 years, the next 20 years, generation after generation, begin to open up our arms and love the community with the love of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to take that $5,000 and guess where we're going to put it? Right back into the community. We could put it away for a rainy day. We could use it to purchase something, but we're going to put it right back into the community because if we pay it forward, we increase our capacity to be a blessing and the blessing continues on and it stays in motion. And instead of being full, we were overflow. Just like there are laws of nature, there are spiritual laws. There are spiritual laws of giving. Jesus says stuff like give and it will be given to you. He also tells us stuff like it's better to give than to receive. Uh, He tells us stuff uh, when it comes to the way we treat people. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you because there's this law of, of sowing and reaping. Outdo each other in showing honor, he says. And if you want to become great, become someone's slave. Become a servant to others. So as we transfer a blessing, the momentum continues. See, if we are not living as generous, giving people, we're putting a lid on what God has designed to overflow. So we're going to pause right here. And at our tables, I want to give you an opportunity to discuss this topic. The question is this. Is your level of generosity creating a lid or an overflow of blessing in your life. Let's discuss. Right. What a fantastic conversation at my table. How's your conversation going? Good? Thumbs up? Praise God. Fun topic, honestly, isn't it? It's great to talk about these things. It's a lot harder to do them. No amens after that statement. How about that? All right, so we're going to get in uh, to what the Word of God teaches on this topic today. Can I ask you to stand before we get started? And if you've got a Bible, grab it in your hand. Maybe you want to open up your Bible app on your phone and treat that as your Bible. What we're going to do is something we do uh, basically every week here. So we're going to make a faith statement over this book that we hold in our hands. And the reason why we do that is because sometimes our soul needs to be reminded of just the magnitude of what is within these pages, that it's so much more than ink and paper, but it's the living and active word of God. Amen. So let's hold up our Bibles and just go ahead and read this statement along with me. Ready? This is my Bible. It is God's word. When I read it and live it, I will become everything it says that I am. If you believe that, say amen. And stay standing, stay standing. We're just going to read one verse. You guys can stand for one verse, right? Turn to Luke chapter 6, verse 38. You can also follow along the screen, but I think it is great practice to learn how to turn those pages and follow along yourself. I mean, shoot, I could have edited the scriptures, right? You got to keep me accountable. Make sure I didn't make a mistake. All right. So Luke chapter six, verse 38. And if you're afraid that I'm taking it out of context, don't worry. I'll share a little bit about the context a little bit later on. So verse 38 says, I give or give 
and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more. Running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you give back. Amen. Somebody say, God, increase my capacity through giving. Amen. You can be seated. That is our, our, our main uh, point today is that God would increase your capacity through giving and increase your capacity to give. And so I want to, speaking of context, because that is just one verse, and it's not really good practice to just pick and choose verses, right? Because sometimes you can read into the scripture something that wasn't intended to be uh, uh, taught. But I want to talk about the word give. The, the dictionary defines the word give as to freely transfer something to someone else. Why do I talk about that? Because giving can be of all sorts of things. It can be physical it can be emotional, it can be spiritual, it can be money, um, it can be mercy, which is the context of this verse right here. You'll see that Jesus, is, if you read a few verses above and below, you see Jesus is talking about forgiving others and so extending mercy. But this is a spiritual law that applies to all types of giving, okay? And there are other scriptures we'll look at that we will reference that actually do talk about specifically money. But today I want to talk about giving in all aspects, because if we are to be living out of an overflow, by definition, we have extra that is to be given unto those around us. And so this is a spiritual law that applies to all giving. For an example, Paul applies a very similar principle uh, to uh, financial giving in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm going to read to you verses 6, 8, and 9. He says, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds uh, will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and, check this out, plenty left over. Why? To share with others. Some of you need to stop and say, Selah. The reason I have leftover is so I can share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. I want you to think about that word forever for a moment. See, what's being taught here by Paul is that as we give, and in this case, we're talking about financially, there is a domino effect that is intended to last forever. Not only will the blessing continue to go on as we bless others and they turn around and bless others also, but the memory of our deeds will last forever. Can you imagine becoming a church that is so generous in their service, so generous in their kindness, in their good deeds, and so generous in their financial givings that they're remembered for all of eternity, that even as people pass on, that church lives on and their reputation goes before them. See, God's desire is to continually increase your capacity to both receive and be a blessing. One thing that I learned about this little thing is really cool, is if you pull one back, all the energy transfers through to the other side and then one goes up. But look what happens when I pull two back. Oops, I lost it. Now two are being elevated on the other side. And God is all about that. He wants to take our blessings and he wants to give us a double blessing and double our impact everywhere we go. And it only stops when we fail to be generous. Love, mercy, grace, service, and our physical resources. He doesn't just want you to have enough, but he wants you to overflow. Now, this is not a prosperity message. This does not mean that God wants every single one of you in here to be a millionaire. In fact, money is only one aspect of it. Maybe your most significant influence and the most significant blessing that you will offer will not be monetary. But the principle is 
the same. God's people should be recognized by their overflow, by what they do with the extra that they have, the extra enthusiasm that they have, the extra strength that they have, the extra joy that they have within. So when you give, it not only meets a physical, spiritual, or emotional need, but it also does something in your own heart. Amen? So I want to give you, I want to start off by giving you two ways that giving will increase your capacity. Two ways that giving will increase your capacity. He says, give and it will be given unto you. And it says, press down, shaken together to make room for more and running over. Number one, giving makes room for more. Giving makes room for more. For more, See, what is being described here is something that would have actually been done to uh, goods, grains, figs. Like maybe figs, they would press them down because uh, they're, um, you can squish them. I'm, I was trying to think of a big word, and I could, it wouldn't come to me. Malleable, maybe? Is that, does that fit? Ooh, I, I mean, somebody was impressed by that, unless I used it incorrectly, right? <laughs> or, or maybe you've got grain or some sort of powder um, resource. And so you, you, you shake it so that it settles to make room for more. And so what's being described here is intentional actions that make room for more per container so that more can be passed on, more can be stored, and more can be poured out. These are intentional acts that increase capacity. And this is what giving is for you and me. It is an intentional act to increase capacity, not prosperity gospel so that I can have a huge bank account, but so I can be a bigger blessing than I was before. I'm telling you, God searches for those of us who would live that way. He is so anxious. It, it, it not, well, I know God doesn't get anxious. Forgive me, right? He's enthusiastically looking for people that he can pour his blessings upon because he knows what they'll do with it. He knows that they'll glorify him through their generosity. So anyway, you give of yourself. It increases your capacity to receive more so that you can give more. We see in the parable of the servants, right? The master went away. He gave 10 talents to one, five talents to the other, one to another, right? And when he comes back, the blessing each one receives is according to what? What they did with what they had already been given. And the size or the amount that they started with had nothing to do with it whatsoever. What did you do with what you have been entrusted in? And the result was a blessing, but the one who took what he had and buried it so that it would not be lost, buried it to contain it, buried it to to, to be safe and to play it safe, he received a consequence. He received a punishment. See, God's desire is to bless us more, but we cannot handle more until we increase our capacity through giving. How many of you know that some people, if they win the lottery, it's going to completely ruin them? It's going to change who they are. You're going to think they're one type of person, and then money gets thrown into the situation, and you see this whole other side that's really, really ugly. Thank God that some of us haven't won the lottery, that some of us haven't come into money that we didn't earn, that we just stumbled into because we may have not had the capacity to steward it well. See, God desires to operate through you the same way today. He goes on to say in that passage, give and you will receive. Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you. Number two, giving causes God's blessings to flow both in and out. And so our capacity is being increased, not so it's just easier to take in, but also it becomes easier to give out. Giving's not a payment in this passage, but we're seeing that it is in fact an investment, that there is a return that comes with it. This principle exists in all areas. It says, the scriptures say stuff like this, the last shall be first, Jesus said, and the first shall be last. 
If you want to be great, become the slave of others, as I said earlier. And after Jesus washed his disciples' feet, the Son of God, he says, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And as you've seen me do, he says, go and do likewise. And he says, now that you know these things, God will bless you for what? For doing them. God will bless you for doing them. See, there's a boomerang effect to generosity of all types. And this is a system that God has created that takes the lid off of our blessing and creates an overflow. The blessings flow to you so that they can flow through you. You hear that? The blessings uh, flow to you so that they can flow through you. God told Abraham in Genesis chapter 22, he sa- it says, this is what the Lord says, because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies and through, somebody say through, through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. All because you have obeyed me. From the very beginning, God's intent when he chose Abraham and Israel as his chosen people was to bless the entire world. See, God has a global perspective. And many of us need to begin to have a global perspective on everything that we own and everything that we have and everything that we do. God desires to bless people through people. I want to challenge you to be a hose instead of a bucket. Be a hose instead of a bucket. See, if there's a fire, a hose is a better answer than a bucket. Because the hose has a continuous outflow because it is connected to an infinite source of water. At least it seems infinite. But a bucket, when it is emptied out, is completely empty. And it takes time to go in and to fill that again. And then God has called us to be a hose. And when he increases our capacity, it's like the widening of that hose so that more water can pass through, so that more life can pass through us, as well as the ability to take in all that he has. Because there's things that he's waiting to give us as he's waiting for us to give out, he will then supply more See, the world is a dry desert that is being consumed by sin. And the answer is a church that offers a hose instead of a bucket. A church that operates out of an overflow. A church that understands they're blessed to be a blessing. That has the favor of God flows to them. They allow it to flow through them. He says to Abraham, because you have not withheld your own son. See, if we could think of one thing to justify as being okay to withhold, we would probably start with our children. Like, I think it seems reasonable for me not want to offer up my child as a sacrifice unto God. But Abraham understood something that is hard for us to wrap our brain around. That everything that he had belonged to God. And number two, he trusted that his God was good and wants to bless him. And it was through one mighty act of sacrificial generosity that God increased Abraham's capacity to receive and to give. And this was a foreshadowing to the ultimate act of generosity in the man Jesus Christ, God incarnate, who came and laid down his life on a cross And what was the result of that? Would you say that that offering was multiplied? Because God gave up his one and only son, now he has millions of adopted sons and daughters that have entered into the family because to those who believed in him, he gave the right to become 
children of God. When we withhold anything, it causes God to withhold the blessing. See, there's things awaiting you that will only be released through generosity. So I ask you this morning, what are you holding? What are you withholding today? What's that one area that is off limits to him? Maybe it's that character flaw that you refuse to confront. Maybe it's that possession. Maybe it's that time you spend that you don't want to give up. What is that one area that's off limits to God? I want to point out that God said to Abraham, I will multiply. Notice how he didn't say, he didn't just simply say, I will bless you. He says, I will multiply. I want to point out that God does not bless us by addition, but by multiplication. See, I heard, I heard someone, re, someone recently say, two times two and two plus two are the same thing. But two plus three and two times three are not the same thing. Same numbers are involved, but the application is completely different. And when we put our numbers in the hands of God, that's where they are multiplied. We have plans for our life. We have goals Sometimes those dreams are big, but we need to understand something this morning, church. His plans are always bigger than yours. He says, my ways are higher than your ways. God alone brings the multiplication, and he's got a dream for you that's bigger than yourself. We see this in uh, the book of John where a boy gives up his lunch, and the result of that lunch is over 5,000 people are fed. And if that wasn't enough, the Bible says that they collected 12 baskets of leftovers. And I think we see uh, a pattern in Scripture that, that goes to show that there's no way Jesus allowed those 12 baskets to just rot. But I guarantee you, they continued to feed people on and on and on because that is the heart of God. Why would there be leftovers just to have this obnoxious uh, show off of look at what I've done? Or am I, uh, is the creator of the universe going to give purpose to every single thing that I do? Church, you can have confidence that anything you put in his hands will be multiplied because that's the kind of God he is. So he says, through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. See, God is always thinking big picture. His blessings were never meant to be hoarded, but to continue overflowing. And if you've been given a blessing today, it's meant to be shared in some capacity. Who knows the name of our church? What are we called? Okay, so we get, so that's interesting. So a lot of us just say fountain, right? Because often we say that in short, because it's, it's really easy to say, welcome to the fountain. But, our, but our, the rest of our name is fountain of life. Now, I feel okay dropping off the rest of it, right? Because it's like fountain of life, international assemblies of God, right? I'm like, whoa, that's a lot. But I don't want to leave out the life. Because I believe that name is birthed from scripture when Jesus was speaking to a woman at the well that was feeling dry and thirsty in her spirit. And although she had something to retrieve water from the well, there was something in her spirit that, that her thirst could only be quenched by the savior of the world. And he said to her, if anyone drinks of the water I give them, they will never thirst again, but instead it will become within them a bubbling spring or a fountain of life. See, where there's a fountain, there's life. If you see a spring out in the middle of the forest, it's going to be surrounded by vegetation, by animals. Civilizations come and settle around bodies of water. But if we do not live a life of generosity, what happens is it's like we put a cork in the life that God has given us. And instead of bringing life, the, the dry, dead things around us remain that way. And church, that simply should not be. As a result, what happens to us? We become like stagnant water. Good for nothing. And if somebody drinks it, it's just going to make them sick. We can live lives as, as Christians in such a way 
that instead of bringing life, we make people sick. See, God has created us to be a fountain of life, but we've st- we got to stop putting a lid on what he has designed to overflow. So I want to wrap up this message this morning by giving you five common things that we put a lid on. And I need a disclaimer here. I made a mistake in the notes that I handed out to you. There's only four referenced in the final question on your homework. So go ahead and write in there as number one, the first thing that should be listed is tithing. Tithing. And that's what we're going to talk about right now. Tithing. And so when you go to your life groups this week, that question is going to read that there's four lids, but there's actually five. And the first one I want you to talk about is tithing. Now let's talk about tithing. Tithing is a word that literally means a tenth. 10% of everything we own, 10% of our income uh, goes back uh, to God. He owns it all, but he says, here, you can keep 90, and I'm going to do something incredible with the 10% that you give me back. And listen to this. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, it says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. I love that translation right there. Try it. I want to extend that invitation to each and every one of you. Try it. Go for it. Try it. Because here's what happens. We have been given uh, things financially. You say, no, 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 I wasn't given anything. I worked for it, Pastor Joe. I got a job. I bust my backside. Where do you think that job comes from? Where do you think, do you, do you not understand that as a believer, you're experiencing the favor of God on your life? Do you not understand that he's the provider of all things? And all this stuff that you think you deserve, that you've worked so hard for, can be gone in an instant. And it is God that provides. And so what happens? happens is we have, God gives us everything we need to survive. And when we refuse to tithe, this is what the Bible says we're missing out on. Does this describe an overflow? I'd say so. He says that he's going to open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing so great you won't even have enough room. And so what happens is when we operate in fear instead of faith and we say, I'm so worried that I'm not going to make enough instead of having a different mentality that says, I'm worried I'm not going to make enough of a difference. And what happens is we put a lid on what God has designed to overflow in our life. It doesn't mean necessarily that he wants each and every one of you to have so much cash that you're swimming in it like Donald Duck right? Or Scrooge Duck, whatever his name was, right? But it means that you're always going to have enough, not just to feed your family, but to bless others because that's what you're called to do. But we put a lid on it because we say, no, I got to make sure I take care of number one. I got to make sure I take care of my family. And we don't trust that God is going to provide. Number two, serving. We put a lid on serving. And here's how we do it. When we only serve when it's convenient or doesn't cost us too much, we put a lid on it. When we sacrifice very little in terms of our comfort and our schedule, we put a lid on it. When we don't carry some of the burden for building up the church and reaching the lost, we put a lid on the blessing. And as a result, culture never changes. The church becomes stagnant, no growth happens, and our gatherings begin to feel empty and void of life. Let me tell you this, living in the overflow means doing your part enthusiastically even when it sometimes hurts. This is a difficult topic to talk about because this is another one of those topics where people are really quick to get offended. But I'm just gonna tell you today, I love you way too much to worry about your feelings. Way too much to worry about your feelings because guess what? Pastors are given to the church to equip the saints for the good works. That means I'm here to shepherd you. And sometimes the shepherd's got to take out his staff and he's got to give you a little smack in the backside and say, get off your rear end and serve. 
And I know you've done it two weeks in a row. But guess what? If you're coming to church, you can serve. Because the church doesn't exist to spoon feed you. The church exists to equip you to do the work of the ministry. And if you're concerned that you're serving too much and you're going to burn out, then you don't understand the power of serving. You don't understand that when you serve out of a generous heart, out of enthusiasm and out of a desire to please God, that he's going to fill you up and you're going to begin to overflow. That overflow doesn't come out of, I only want to serve one time a month. Okay, you can email me and I'm not even going to give do the joke where I give you somebody else's email address. You can email me at joe at the fountainphx.org because I can take it because I love you that much. This has nothing to do with Joe really wants to grow his church. Joe wants to build his kingdom, and so he's going to take advantage of people and manipulate them and make them feel guilty so that they'll serve more, so that he can fill the chair and have a big ego. No, this is about Joe wanting to shepherd his people to grow in their faith, to set an example for their children of what's really important, what really matters, so that when they grow old, they won't stray far from it. Church, sometimes we got to serve even when it hurts. Number three, evangelism. This is understanding that evangelism is not for the professionals, but it's for the everyday Joes, the everyday, uh, what do they say for girls? Jane, there you go. John, or it's like John and Jane Doe, right? So the everyday Johns, the everyday Janes that you are being equipped to evangelize as well. So what happens is we put it, so we just put a lid, right, on tithing. And then we just talked about what happens when we put a lid on serving. And now what happens is when we don't invite and we don't share our story, we don't share our faith, we don't share the gospel, we put a huge lid that keeps there's just, a, there's just an enthusiasm. Steve knows about this, right, Steve? There's, there's an enthusiasm. There's a passion that rises up within us. There's a, there's, a, there's a heart of worship that is cultivated when we evangelize. Because what we're doing is we're being a part of the most incredible miracle that has ever taken place. It's when someone was in complete darkness and you shine light on their situation. And suddenly they can see and what was dead is now alive. And when you're the person that speaks those words of life into them, man, the result is, does that, does that return to you, Steve? Does that come back to you, Steve? Does that make a difference in your life? Does it fill you with life? Does it fill you with joy? Does it make you want to go and do it again? Are you chasing that because you want to make heaven as full as possible? This is what happens, church when we do the work of evangelism, but we put a lid on it and what happens is we miss out on that experience. We miss out on experiencing God in that way. And we begin to adopt this wrong thinking that evangelism is for the professionals. And so at the very least, like I can invite people to church, but if you think that's all you're required to do, you're missing out on the overflow. The kingdom of God's not going to grow that way. Kingdom of God's not going to grow because you get the right pastor behind the pulpit preaching the right sermons. The kingdom of God is going to grow when God's people take the best thing that's ever happened to them and share it with others because they love them and they care about their eternal destination. You're living in the overflow when the gospel flows out through word and deed. It's the story you tell with your mouth and it's the story you tell with your life. See, the great commission is accomplished through a great multitude of the commissioned. I'll say that again. The great commission is accomplished through a great multitude of the commissioned. Number four, Sometimes we put a a lid on worship. Worship is something that we were created to do. It was something that's supposed to bubble out of us. In this context, we're going to 
worship is such a broad term. We talk about it all the time, um, Rochelle and I, because worship is just everything. Like worship, if I could narrow it down, it's just, it's a committed life to God. It's a surrendered heart, right? But for this context, we'll talk about public expressive worship because there's power when we gather together and we proclaim his name together. We sing his name together. We give thanks together. We share testimonies one to another. Tell me about what God did for you lately. Don't just tell me what he did in the Bible, but tell him about what he did for you this morning. And when we do that, it creates life all around us. Have you ever heard somebody just sharing what God did in their life and all of a sudden it sparks a memory and you realize God just did something for you too and so you start to share it and then that touches someone else over here and it's like fire just catches everybody. But when we come in on a Sunday and we're like, it's been a rough week. I'm just gonna sit through this thing. I don't got the energy to live my hands. I'm just gonna listen. I'm not gonna sing along. No one wants to hear me sing anyway. It's off key, right? We have our arms folded. What we can do unknowingly sometimes is put a lid on our worship. And you say, well, Joe, I'm not demonstrative like that. That's not my personality. I'm not asking you to be me, jumping up and down like a bunny rabbit up here every Sunday. But what I want for you is for you to be free. Because there's a freedom that's available to every single one of us. Jesus, I was thinking of this this morning in prayer. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But you know something, church? It's not the gates of hell that we need to fear. It's the cage we put ourselves in. We, we slam the door shut and it's locked, but we hold the keys in our hand and yet we remain behind bars. One of the ways that we do that is in worship, by not pressing in, uh, by sitting back, we put a lid on it. When we don't press in, we put a lid on it. When we don't show outward expression of our love for Jesus, we put a lid on it. When we don't give thanks or share with others, we put a lid on it. And so our worship is limited. There may even be something significant going on inside here, and that's good. I don't wanna bash that, but no one benefits by your worship. And sometimes when we gather together publicly, it's okay to be expressive, and it's okay that others benefit from your worship as well. Am I making sense? No one's encouraged by your testimony that way. No one can see on the outside what God is doing on the inside when you don't worship in that way. But see, someone who's living in the overflow will not have to manufacture worship because it's gonna come bubbling up out of a sense of gratitude. If you're living your life as a lifestyle of worship unto him, a life that's submitted to him, you're gonna walk into Sunday mornings with anticipation I can't wait till the music gets loud because I'm going to let it loose because I saw God moving in my life in such a powerful way this week. He used me to share my faith with a stranger on the corner. He used me to pray over my unbelieving spouse. He used me to share Jesus and lead my eight-year-old to Christ. Whatever it is, when we're actively involved and living in the overflow, man, worship comes so easy and so natural. Finally, the last one is community. When we show up late, we put a lid on it. When we don't connect to a life group, we put a lid on it. When we leave early, we put a lid on it. When we keep a safe distance between us and others because we've been hurt, we put a lid on it. See, what happens is when we put a lid on something, we still contain the truth. It's just incredibly hindered. Because you'll know that the Bible talks about healing and freedom and joy and a fulfilled life, but you won't be experiencing it for yourself. And so what happens is Francis Chan says that if we ever do evangelize, 
we're like a really bad salesman trying to sell a product that hasn't even worked for us. So what happens is we don't get discipled. The Bible says iron sharpens iron, but there's no, I don't even allow any friction to be in my life relationally because that hurts too much. And so I'm going to keep a distance. I'm going to stay in the back. I'm going to stay on the edges. I'm not going to get in a group. So that, what that means is we have no one to check our blind spots. I have no one in my life that can speak with any authority to me and, and call me out and be like, Joe, you are off track, dude. What are you doing with your life, man? Like you're not applying the word of God. Like God has something so much better for you than this. And guess what? I'm gonna understand that person loves me and I'm gonna be able to receive that without getting offended and finding a church that's all about fluff instead of telling me the truth. And so what happens is we stumble over things that could have been avoided. We can't get the support we need when life gets hard. And then we're offended because no one reached out to us. And as tragic as that is, I'm gonna tell you, you you carry a large portion of blame when that happens. Because the church is here. Opportunities has been given, bridges have been built, but you've gotta make the decision to step onto that bridge and cross to the other side. And I'm thankful that right now we have started a new season and there are 12 people that have decided to go on the rooted journey because they have determined that they are no longer willing to put a lid on what God wants to do in their lives. They want to experience the overflow. I'll close with this. You guys are comfortable up here, right? You don't mind that I'm taking forever? Perfect. They said I have 30 more minutes. I remember the, my first day on the school bus, first day of kindergarten. Uh, I got on the bus okay. I got off the bus okay. I went to school okay. Got back on the bus okay. And when we got back on the bus, the bus driver said, listen, uh, this is my first time through the route. I understand some of you don't get off at every stop. So I'm going to drive by every stop, but I'm going to keep going unless you tell me this is your stop. Okay. I thought that was kind of weird, but we drove on and Stop after stop. I'm like, okay, that's not my stop. That's not my stop. And I just began to become overwhelmed with anxiety. Like, what if I don't recognize my stop? What if I say it's my stop and then I get off and I'm like, this wasn't it. Way too much pressure to put on a kindergartner. So we finally get to my stop, which is just uh, this back way entrance to uh, Modernet Trailer Park in Tempe, Arizona. That's my, that's my background. We pulled up to it and I'm thinking, I think that's it, but I'm not sure. I think that's it, I'm not sure. And I was so scared, so paralyzed by fear of being wrong that I didn't say anything. So the bus driver drove on. There's about three or four more stops and finally I'm the only kid left on the bus. And he turns to me and says, son, where do you live? And I said, Modernet Trailer Park. So he dropped me off at the front entrance of Modernet Trailer Park. I was about a half an hour late. My mom was freaking out, but here's the deal. I was on the right bus. I was heading in the right direction. But because I wasn't willing to engage relationally, I missed my stop. Church, it's not enough to be in the right church that has right doctrine and solid teaching. It's not enough to be in the same room with the right people going in the right direction. If you're not actively engaged in biblical community, you are willingly placing a lid on what God has designed to overflow in your life. And I challenge you this morning, would you stand with me? We'll close with this. I want us to take a time to quiet ourselves and to allow God to search our hearts and to reveal to us where we've put a lid on the overflow. Maybe it's in tithing. And God says what he said in the Old Testament, try it, see what happens. I double dog dare you, tithe. And then tell me that you regretted it. They didn't feel good to give. That somehow it didn't return to you in some way, shape, or form. I dare you to tithe and tell me it doesn't work. Maybe it's serving. 
And God's saying, I want you to go beyond just serving whenever you feel like it or it's convenient to you. And instead, I'm going to start serving at the level God wants me to serve. Not at the level Pastor Joe wants you to serve. But allow God to speak to you. Maybe it's evangelism and you're like, I'm not an evangelist. (laughs) But God says, let me tell you who you are. Maybe it's worship and you say, I'm a very reserved person. Okay, but maybe, maybe for you, really stepping out into freedom looks like this. Maybe for someone else, it looks like this. But whatever that next step is, allow God to break you free from that place where you've put a lid on your worship. And maybe it's community and you're like, I've been going to this church for decades, but I'm not a part of a life group. I've never been through Rooted or maybe I've been through Rooted, but unfortunately that group wasn't able to stay together. And so right now I'm not connected in community. And God says, oh, I've got so much more for you than Sunday morning. You're so missing out on the overflow. You need to get connected in community here at this church. And if you're not, it's nobody's fault but yours. I hope you guys will come back next week. I really do, because I love you very, very much. And can I be honest with you for a minute? I'm kind of going through a season of frustration. Can I get really real with you? Because you know that I love you, I really do. I'd do anything for you guys. I'm, I'm disappointed. There's some frustrations in ministry. The leadership's hard, and I don't mean to boo-hoo and make you feel sorry for me. But there's some things that I'm disappointed and frustrated about, and here's the tempting thing. The tempting thing is to just step back and not offend. But in reality, that's a disservice to you. And if you look at Jesus, there were some times he was pretty harsh with his disciples. And I've never called any one of you in here Satan before. <laughs> so you can be thankful for that. But I just, I truly, from the depth of my heart, I hope, I hope you hear the authenticity and you believe this. I love you so much. I'm willing to let truth offend you and wound you. And if I'm wrong, or if you feel judged, if you feel like this judgment's unfair, and if I am in the wrong, then I proactively repent. Because I certainly don't want to do that. I don't want you to think it's about me getting what I want out of you. But I truly want to see God overflowing out of you. And so this morning... As you bow your heads and close your eyes, the team is going to lead us in this song. And I just ask you, this is between you and God, not between you and Pastor Joe. And if I offended you, I truly am sorry. I love you. But would you allow the Holy Spirit to search your heart this morning and to expose any lids that you may have put on your life? And what I'd like to encourage you to do is as a step of faith and obedience, bring that lid to the front what we refer to as the altars, because an altar, an altar is where you bring your offering, where you lay something down and you don't pick it back up again, but you let the fire of God consume it. And there's some lids in your life that he wants to release you from and he wants to consume it at the altar. And so when he reveals to you what that lid is, I invite you to come to the front, maybe kneel or stand and in prayer, Give that to him and tell him to take the lid off of your life so you can step into the overflow. Amen? So, Father, right now in Jesus' name, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. And I pray, Jesus, that you uh, would remove all offense. If I stepped out in the flesh at all, God, forgive me and mend the wounds that I may have caused. But if I'm led by your Holy Spirit, and even if I'm not, God, even if I, I was out of line, I pray that you would use the truth that it was in that and that it would bring change and produce fruit in our lives this morning, God. So as you reveal those things to us, God, we leave them at the altar so that we can step in to the overflow. Increase our capacity today, Father. 
in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just take some, a moment to respond to the Lord.
Jesus. And Father, you can have my heart, whatever that means, because I can trust you that you will not abuse me, but you will bless me. That you want what's best for me. You don't want to milk me for all I'm worth. You want me to trust you to satisfy me and sustain me. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. And I want to echo those words to you too, just to be clear. Because when a pastor delivers a corrective word, it's so often taken for what it's not meant to mean. I understand we all need balance in our life. We need days off. We need rest. Especially those of you that when you serve, you don't even get to be in church. I understand that, okay? But I also believe that we have a misconception that serving is nothing more than just a favor for the leaders that we have above us. When in fact, it's God wanting you to connect into your purpose and that there's f fulfillment that comes from that. So love you guys. I pray that you have a blessed week this week. Um, don't forget to take home your, your paper.